I hope you all have enjoyed your holiday season and ready for 2013. Today we have a special guest from Cleveland who's going to uh, be introduced by Dr. Craig McLean in just uh, a few minutes. But a couple of things about this day which are important for uh, us to uh, stay uh, acquainted with history and how it has um, shaped us. Back in 1198, 1198, was the death of Averroes, and I'm not going to describe his entire name, which includes seven words. But it was a Spanish Islamic philosopher who actually wrote Generalitis in Medicine. It was a treatise that was used for a long, long time because he was a famous interpreter of Aristotle. And he wrote about anatomy, but he also wrote about hygiene, prevention, diagnosis and treatment of diseases. He was essentially trying to codify the medical knowledge of that time. Um, and he, so he became very famous for that. Back in 1815, on this day, was the birth of Countess of Lovelace Augusta Ada King. Why is she important? Well, she was the daughter of Lord Byron, and she wanted to be a scientist. Think about a woman being a scientist in, the, in those days. She met Charles Babbage in 1833 and worked on that analytical engine and also got an interest for computers. And in fact, she is recognized as the first to understand the potential of computers and has been called the first computer programmer. And I don't know if many of you know the programming language ADA, ADA. And in fact, that was named in that fashion because of her. Back in 1901 on this day was the first time that the King of Sweden distributed the Nobel Prize in accordance to Alfred Nobel. And finally, back on this day, back in 1934, was the birth of Howard Martin Temin, which many people don't remember, but together with Renato de Velco and David Baltimore, he co-discovered reverse transcriptase. And because of that, they won the Nobel Prize of 1975. Important pieces of information, because we all use these things now today and don't quite know where these things come from. So we're gonna to learn today about another important topic, and it's about chronic liver disease, ascites, hepatorenal syndrome. And our guest speaker will be introduced by Dr. Craig McLean. Craig. Thanks, Jesse. It's a, a real pleasure to uh, have Dr. Kevin Mullen here today as our speaker. Uh, Kevin, as you'll appreciate when you hear him talk, is originally from Ireland. And actually, we were uh, just having our fellow conference uh, up here a little bit earlier. Uh, I'm originally, my family's from Scotland. Uh, and in Scotland, the incidence of alcoholic liver disease is going through the roof. But Kevin told me that in Ireland, it's uh, almost not seen anymore. So we're not sure why that is, but we're talking more about that. But uh, Kevin came to the United States and he spent really his career at uh, Cleveland uh, Metropolitan. And uh, he's uh, been head of uh, GI there. He's run the fellowship program. He currently directs hepatology there. And Kevin's really the world's expert in hepatic encephalopathy and uh, talked to us last night about that at our gut club and is also an expert in all types of complications of decompensated liver disease and today he's going to talk about ascites and the hepatorenal syndrome uh, which are huge problems that we see uh, in our hospital and keep our patients unfortunately getting rehospitalized. so kevin it's a pleasure to have you here I don't have a slide with me today, but uh, but there is a slide I'd love to have had to show Craig that says the Sc Scottish drink like the Irish are supposed to. And uh, I think that they are drinkers, uh, at least at the moment, anyway. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about ascites. Um, it's actually, uh, there are some things about ascites that are very basic, that are very important to know. I know as a transplant center, or with access certainly to easy transplants in here, that you're not going to make the mistakes that a lot of people in practice do, which is to underestimate how bad it is for a cirrhotic to have a cytase. There actually should be always the question should be uh, when when will I refer them for transplant assessment? 
So it's, in the side raises, the 10-year risk in, in a compensated cirrhotic of getting a, a side raise is 50%, which is pretty remarkable. And the most common complications of chronic liver disease, and I have a lot of these patients, uh, are a side raise and a panic encephalopathy. And uh, uh, patients who have uh, side raise are, as you know, are at a great risk of uh, infection, particularly spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, but all sorts of infections as well. They can get renal failure, which I'm going to talk about as well. And we're trying to give an evidence-based talk here as much as we can. And uh, so I'll talk about some of the, the recent studies that have been done in the paddle renal syndrome. And then, uh, as I said already, once you have a side raise, particularly if it doesn't mobilize quickly, uh, you should be sending the patient off for transplant evaluation. I always tell my patients, I'm sending you so you will have that option if you get worse. And they understand that. I'm not sending you because you're so bad now, but I'm worried about what you'd be like in two years' time. But I'm really worried about what it'd be like in one year's time. So <clears throat> the natural history and mortality in patients with new onset of side raise uh, is uh, uh, well illustrated by Planus' Plan study. If you look at this, one year mortality 15%, five year mortality 43.5%. So that's another uh, population study. Not a huge study, but nonetheless, uh, uh, the, the, the data is quite persuasive. Uh, the mortality in refractory sinus patients, these are the people who just don't respond to diuretics, or every time you give them diuretics in any dose, their BUN creatinine goes up. Uh, if, they're, uh, if they have meet the definition of refractory ascites, their actual mortality in one year is 60 to 70 percent. So again, I would say to you, you need all, near most of your patients who have ascites, unless they respond very well to diuretics, immediately should be sent for a liver transplant evaluation because that is an important part of their management. The five-year uh, five survival in patients with ascites and, and who are not transplanted is about 50 percent depending on which figure you look at, uh, and it's only 50% of those figures that if they were transplanted. So people who are transplanted uh, have a much better survival than people who are not transplanted. Now, I, I'm, I'm amazed how often uh, people are sent to our endoscopy and uh, to have a large volume person thesis who are just fat. <laughs> uh, now, admit it, all of you have made this mistake. You have this abdomen that seems to be out to here, and you, you know, must have a side effects, you know. Patients insist that they're not eating anything, and, and yet, you know, they put on 50, 60 pounds of weight. And, and yet, quite often, uh, it is actually fat. And, and, and even though it says here, the best uh, imaging is the best diagnostic tool, and by the way, most of us now have our own ultrasound machine, which is very helpful for paracentesis. Uh, but nonetheless, I find the umbilical, if the umbilical is, is still in any, okay, then their patients are, don't have ascites. And if it's out, uh, then they might have ascites, or they may have some inter-abdominal lesion that's expanded. So the any out thing on the belly button is pretty helpful. Uh, although men in particular can't tell you what their belly button was like 10 years ago, which, so they're not very observant, or they can't even see their belly button anymore. So, but it, it is something to think about. And uh, don't be uh, you know, embarrassed too much if you send someone down for volume, high volume paracentesis and uh, they don't have a size. That happens to everyone. In fact, I can tell you that 50% of the patients when I was in the think clinic that were sent down, for a while anyway, uh, did not have any ascites. They were sent for large volume paracentesis. Um, physical exam is not specific for ascites. Uh, it's very hard in obese patients, and many of our patients have central obesity, so it's hard to assess things. Shifting dullness. Yes, if you take your time, you probably can figure out when the shifting donors, but I don't think it's all that reliable. Uh, and shifting donors, though, has been looked at in a clinical trial. Dr. Runyon, a famous societies uh, guy, uh, did a study and said that shifting donors' diagnostic tool was 83% sensitive and 56% specific, so it's pretty low. And the negative predictive value was 90%. I'm not sure I'm as good as Bruce at doing that sort of stuff, but anyway. Uh, so a sideways diagnosis is not quite as straightforward as you think. I don't think it's appropriate, though, to have someone with a very large abdomen and just to say, well, they have a sideways and never confirm that they do or not. I mean, you're supposed to, when everyone, anyone seems to have a sideways, we tend to want to know uh, more about the fluid or whatever it is that's expanding that abdomen. <coughs> Imaging is the best diagnostic tool. I presume you have your own bedside uh, ultrasound. Now, if you don't, uh, it's probably a good idea. Uh, the fluid wave, 
again, is not so reliable. And the puddle sign, unless you're very good at percussing from underneath the bed, uh, is not a very reliable test. And most of us are in danger if we do that and, and percuss the patient from below, uh, between uh, who's actually lying on two beds. That if the beds go out, the patient will fall on top of us. Now, I've actually tried to do that, the puddle test. Does anyone know what it is? But anyway, all right. We can talk about it afterwards. So anyway, let's assume we have a large amount of fluid in the abdomen. A lot of the stuff is due to liver disease, but there are some non-liver disease things that are very important that can lead to uh, cytase. And uh, there's another one I'll mention in a second as well. So cancer, metastatic cancer to the peritoneum will give you a cytase. Uh, typically, it's a high protein, but not always. Schistosomiasis, we don't see that much here, but apparently uh, in some cases of uh, schistosomiasis, you can get uh, a cytase. And which, is, and which is nothing to do with portal hypertension. Myxedema. Now, the interesting thing about myxedema is there's no question, and I've written this up actually, there's no question that people with myxedema can get a cytase and they may have a pericardial effusion. But Bruce Runyon, who's, who's right about nearly everything in a cytase, uh, does say that the gradient, the, the, the greater than 1.1 gram of, uh, of albumin that you're supposed to have in portal hypertension is present in myxedema, which is a cytase, and I think that's wrong. I think, in fact, the patients that he had had, had concomitant heart failure, and that's why the, the gradient was high. But in fact, in myxedema, the gradient was low. We, we presented the case in the annals of internal medicine a couple of years ago. So, so this is correct by assigning non-portal hypertension to the, the ascites with myxedema. Pancreatitis uh, and some other uh, entities. And recently, I started to get a whole pile of referrals from our lupus or clinic and I've begun to realize that, uh, especially if they have abdominal pain, a lot of SLE patients will have a cytase if you look hard enough for it. And occasionally we've tapped them and they have a sort of an inflammatory kind of a cytase. Uh, all the other things that give you portal hypertension give you, uh, are listed there, cirrhosis, acute liver failure, uh, bug Chiari syndrome, uh, VOD, and so forth, uh, are the typical causes of a cytase. And those are associated with the serum ascites albumin gradient, which is uh, greater than 1.1. So let's be specific about that. Don't use the total protein. Use the albumin in the fluid, and use the albumin in the blood, and then you uh, serum albumin minus acidic fluid albumin gives you the, the, uh, the uh, uh, serum ascites albumin gradient. You should take the sample the same day. You shouldn't have one two months after the other. And if you get greater than 1.1, that is well over 90% accurate in, in predicting that there's an underlying portal hypertension causing that ascites. Now, you need to be a little bit careful because if you have an infiltrating malignancy in the liver, it's giving you portal hypertension primarily by clogging up all the, the veins and uh, capillaries in the liver, sinusoids in the liver, and you'll get a portal hypertension, but it's actually from a malignancy. But most of the time, when you see an, a SAG greater than 1.1, there's underlying portal hypertension, usually intrinsic liver disease, sometimes heart failure. Uh, in our hospital, we have a very aggressive heart failure service, but uh, whenever they get a cytase, they deny any possibility that the, the heart failure is the cause of their cytase, and they send them over to us. And, and by the way, if you have heart failure patients with a cytase, don't give them albumin. Uh, pulmonary edema is not treated very well in the liver tank. Um, so the SAG, I think early on in, the, in, in a person's uh, getting bouts of ascites, the SAG should be established. And ideally, in your in electronic medical records, it should be very obvious. You know, it should be put somewhere in the records where you can actually find it, because it does. It's good to make sure that every single patient has had a SAG done at least once early on, because if you don't do it, you can be missing the other diagnoses that have totally different treatment. Now, the pathophysiological changes in the cytase uh, are always, was all, were always a bit of a mystery to me. Uh, you know, the cirrhosis, I understand, there's an in, uh, there's a, a, the flow of the blood through the liver is impeded. How endothelial dysfunction occurs exactly in liver disease, I'm not sure of. But as a result, they uh, develop um, uh, increased uh, synthesis of nitric oxide, which is released in circulation. This vasodilates. Uh, the splanting venous uh, circulation, arterial uh, uh, splanting vasodilatation occurs. The way I look at it, normally there's a lot of vasodilatory uh, compounds released in the in the abdomen. They go up the portal vein and are just normally cleared by the liver completely. If the liver is not working well or the shunting around the liver, these vasodilatory compounds start 
circulating around and you get a vasodilated system from top to bottom. That's the way I look at it anyway. Eventually, what happens when you vasodilate like that, you'll, have a, you'll actually have an increased cardiac output, you'll have, va you'll have vasodilatation, but the effect of circulating volume depletes. So you've, everything's opened up, you haven't got enough to fill it up, so then what happens is the body has a system for dealing with perceived uh, hyperperfusion or, or, or inadequate volume, and it is activation of the renin angiotensin system. Uh, Antidiuretic hormone uh, is increased, and the sympathetic nervous system starts firing more. So a lot of things happen as a result of this vasodilatation. And then the, the net result is sodium retention, water retention, and then the extracellular fluid compartment overloads, and then you eventually start to get a side, particularly, of course, when your albumin is low. What exactly happens to make you go from this sequence of events to shutting down your kidneys altogether is uh, not totally known. It's rather frightening, actually, uh, to, to realize how little blood flow is going through the kidney in patients with advanced liver disease. But they're usually they're compensated, and then just something happens, there's a precipitating factor, and the kidney sh shuts down. And our colleagues, uh, Ginnis, in particular, uh, and Rodej, uh, have done tremendous amounts of work on this in Barcelona, and are still the leading authorities on the pathophysiology of uh, uh, for hypertension and the side base in patients with chronic liver disease. Now, the ASLD guidelines for the management of ascites are, are pretty well uh, uh, an adaption of what Bruce Runyon uh, put together. And so you have a, a signs of new onset ascites. You do uh, a paracentesis. Uh, you, as he said, you should send out uh, at least the first time a side base fluid cell count. And, and he says total protein, but we usually actually try and get an albumin and calculate the SAT. And if we suspect, for a variety of reasons, the patient has an infection, we will do, uh, we'll actually do a culture as well. And we often suspect that, but not always, because a lot of these patients are coming back with repeated taps. You don't have to send every single tap off if they're on repeated paracentesis. We try to get people to do sodium restriction. Uh, I don't know if we're failing or not. It would be interesting just to go out to a couple of hundred serotics who've been instructed and actually find out how much sodium they're taking. I, I, I can't really tell by talking to them. I, I do emphasize uh, the fact that you, you're supposed to restrict salt. Uh, and, uh, but I must admit, I rather uh, I increase the diuretics rather than uh, beat them over the head with the uh, low-salt diet. Um, uh, if they're still having uh, ascites despite uh, fluid, uh, sodium restriction uh, and usually diuretics as well, we start repeating uh, therapeutic uh, paracentesis of indicators. George Gabusta, who was a famous uh, hepatologist who worked in Metro, was also a certified nephrologist, and he did uh, studies many years ago and showed that if you put people to bed for 30 days, you can actually mobilize their ascites. So I think the real function flow of changes and they actually start to spontaneously diarrhea. But as you know, you can't keep a patient in hospital for 30 days just to diarrhea them anymore. So we are doing repeated paracentesis. And it's amazing, uh, most, uh, most of my fellows now uh, will tell you that they've learned how to do the paracentesis very well from doing you know, 20 or 30 patients who they did, sorry, say, 10 or 15 times. So that's a very common phenomenon. Um, if the volume of the, the paracentesis fluid is more than four, I, I use five liters. Then we give albumin, you know, as we uh, as we sort of get to the higher volume, the site has been pulled out. We give albumin, and this uh, is uh, can be overdone, but certainly is very helpful in some patients. Because I had a, a patient uh, who uh, I was uh, over in the clinic, clinic uh, on transplant service for quite a while, and I noticed I was tapping this guy on a regular basis, and I remember saying to him, "Do you have any problem after I do the tap?" You know. Uh, you don't uh, get any albumin infusions. This was a policy at the time. I think. This is oh, no problem at all. So anyway, uh, a couple of weeks later, I'm walking. There's a there's a big long corridor from the from the clinical area to the uh, area in the, in the clinic where you park your car. The patients park the car, and I'm walking down this long corridor. And I see this guy on his hands and knees crawling along the floor, and I look at him and he realizes this patient that I was talking to him a couple of weeks ago, and I said, well, why are you crawling? And he said, I always crawl after the thing. I can't stand up, but I just, I can hang on long enough to get outside the door, and that way I can get back home. <laughs> so he would crawl. He would literally then, by the time he got to and sometimes he had to put the seat completely down for a while, and then he'd be okay.
but just shows you what goes on sometimes. Anyway, and by the way, remember, all cirrhotic patients have, tend to have lower blood pressures anyway, and some people overreact to that. And I, I, when, you, when a cirrhotic goes into an operating room, they're really in trouble because they have vasodilated uh, systems, their blood pressure is quite low, uh, they have good cardiac output, and it needs to just, just pour fluid in. So that's why they nearly all get severe edema, and sometimes even new onset of sinus after surgery. And I'd love to prevent that happening in the future, but it's been very hard to do anything about it now. We don't do peritoneal venous shunts anymore. I'm not sure, uh, Craig, if you do them here or not. There are some uh, shunts that you can do to the exterior or have access to the exterior uh, for malignant decitis, which, of course, is very, very difficult to manage. But we don't do uh, peritoneal venous shunts. And mainly for someone with intractable decitis that we can't manage with everything else, diuretics included or we literally transplant the patient. Uh, and this uh, usually is successful in getting rid of it. Okay. Now, the treatment of ascites, again, the ASLD guidelines, so uh, sodium restriction, and, and there are some great dietitians who can actually get patients to do that. Uh, and um, just with that alone, uh, I'm not sure it's 15%, but they can have, uh, if you just restrict the sodium, they'll, they'll actually, their edema and even their ascites occasionally will Will, will do well just on sodium restriction. We never wait to see what, whether it happens. We just put them on diuretics. And uh, in internal medicine, anyway, I've noticed that a lot of people use Lasix or furosemide without aldactone. We tend to promote both of these we use, both uh, the doses, uh, or single dose of 100 spironolactone and 40 of furosemide as a single dose in the morning. So when I see patients come to me, they're just on furosemide and they have hypokalemia. So I, I, I mean, normally we use the two together in this ratio. And, uh, and then we type trait doses or they recommend the ACLD every three to five days and maintaining this five to two ratio. And then they say to a maximum of 400 milligrams a day of aldactone or spironolactone and 160 furosemide. That's, that's pushing it there. Occasionally, uh, amyloride is used in patients who have pain with myelomastia. But I tell you, amyloride is useless. It, it doesn't work properly. Uh, and you have to give very high doses, and I'm not sure it works. So in my patients who develop uh, painful gynecomastia, uh, I will give, I will get them to have a mastectomy. I'm serious. Uh, so they, some of them have mastectomies because spironolactone is such a great drug, and they don't need breast cells, which you, so you can just remove them, you know. Uh, <laughs> So uh, now, there's uh, a number of large-scale randomized controlled trials. By the way, just to, just to explain to you again, this, these talks that uh, on portal hypertension and liver disease are supposed to be as evidence-based as we could possibly make them. So we're trying to emphasize some of this data. So, this, um, so these are the trials on uh, TIPS versus uh, serial large volume person pieces. So, as some of you may or may not know, uh, some people come in once or twice a month to get a tap. We have people come in every week to get a tap occasionally, but we know they're not staying on their diet. But they come in once or twice a month, uh, or even once a month, uh, for, uh, versus uh, doing a TIPS. That's really what the question was here. So tense, uh, the inclusion criteria for the, for the Russell study was tense society is a failure of four weeks of therapy. So you just were getting nowhere, uh, you were getting pre realized leukemia or whatever. And the control of ascites uh, with the TIPS was 61%, and of course, by definition, there was very little control of the ascites with the medical therapy, which wasn't working. The survival wasn't enormously different, but it was different, 69% uh, versus 52%, but encephalopathy rates were higher in the patients who had TIPS, not surprisingly, compared to the ones that didn't. Um, but not a huge difference. Guinness' study, and this is from Barcelona, they have the same kind of criteria, isotopes refractory to medical therapy, pretty big number. 51% um, were uh, controlled by having tips versus 17. So they probably defined their patients very well and then compared to the, uh, doing a tips, and they presumably got a good bit of expertise in doing tips, uh, you got, uh, you got a, a pretty good response. More than half of the patients had a control of their ascites, which is very impressive. Um, survival uh, wasn't that impressive, uh, but it was improved maybe a little bit. And encephalopathy, again, was worse in the patients who had TIPS than the patients who didn't have TIPS. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And Senyal, uh, who has one of the biggest studies, 
the same idea, control of site is uh, 60 versus 16 percent. So it looks like it's worth it on the basis of the control of the site if you put the tips in. And I do emphasize you need to have a person who's good at doing tips. And then uh, survival wasn't really improved in that study, so the diet of maybe some of the complications associated with tips, loss of liver function, and things like that. And then Salerno, who is actually very active in this field, um, slightly different entry criteria. Control of asylees was 80% versus 40%. So again, that was very good. But for the tips, survival in this study was uh, was significant. Uh, but, um, and uh, they have also had a set up. So there's a tips versus paracentesis. The mortality at 30 days, 24 months, and then looking at the other endpoint, which is rehumanized ascites, we have some uh, benefits from uh, doing the tips. But ultimately, the data is still out on uh, on mortality, but reaccumulation of ascites is actually quite effective. Transplant-free survival according to treatment with tips and total paracentesis. This is a meta-analysis again by Salerno, and you can see tips makes that a little better than total paracentesis. So you do a tips. In this study, anyway, you'll, you'll have better survival. And this is a little more complicated. This is survival depending on what your male score is. And there's a lot of lines going along there. But basically, the patients uh, who had tips uh, did a bit better in certain uh, uh, subtypes of the male score. The worse your male score, the less effect there was. But then it was more important than ever to do something. So the tips, the potential complications of doing them, and I assume everyone in the room knows what a tip. Just to just to remind you, we, you put a, a catheter or a, 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 a stent into the liver, and it really basically connects the portal vein to the hepatic vein, bypassing all that obstruction that occurs within the liver substance. The problem, of course, about doing that is that there's a blood going flying down the uh, this uh, the stent and going out of the liver without necessarily getting a lot of processing from the the cirrhotic liver. So. So you're shunting a lot of blood through the liver, which at least you're lowering the pressure, and you're, of course, primarily, uh, we're interested in trying to prevent recurrent bleeding. So that's what TIPS is doing. Sometimes when we do this, we have a, a, a new onset of, of encephalopathy, or we, um, uh, or we uh, uh, get encephalopathy that's very hard to manage. The incidence has been varied depending on the study and the type of patients that have been done. Uh, but the relative re risk is 2.25 according to the MECO meta-analysis and uh, at least 20 to 30 percent instance of pre-severe encephalopathy. So once you put a TIPS in, you're like, you're, you have a decent chance, 30 to 40 percent chance of developing severe or encephalopathy, which might be hard to manage. You don't know that until you do it. There's a big argument between the Germans and the uh, uh, Spanish about what is uh, the best way to avoid uh, severe encephalopathy after placing TIPS. The Germans believe that you should reduce the uh, gradient, the porcelain gradient, by 50%, and the uh, Spanish uh, say you should reduce it down to less than 10. Some people even go lower than that. But if you if you do a tip to make the, the, the pressure gradient almost nothing across the, uh, the liver bed, then you're, you're almost guaranteed to get encephalopathy. Other complications are stenosis. Now, we use COVID stents these days, so we don't have nearly as much stenosis, uh, but that used to be a huge problem. Um, dislocation of the stent, literally moving, that's rare enough these days. And I must say, you know, the, the technology has improved a lot for TIPS, and our radiology colleagues have become very, very good at placing these. Uh, intravascular hemolysis with a very high uh, uh, indirect bilirubin, you'll see sometimes uh, occasionally the liver perforations. I've heard of uh, liver perforation a few times in the process of trying to place these TIPS. Surprisingly, it hasn't killed too many patients right immediately, but nonetheless, that's a very good risk of having cardiac failure right after the tips is a, a hard thing to manage. Renal failure because of dye and stuff like that that the radiologist is using is certainly an issue. And then liver failure. Uh, most of our colleagues are very, very worried about doing a tip in someone with a child's pew greater than 10 or 11, a male score greater than 18. I, my, my radiologists don't like even above 12. But uh, So if you already have a bit of room in, say, of 3.5 or 5 even, the radiologist will say, we don't want to put it in and we, uh, we don't have to because we're worried we're going to aggravate uh, underlying liver function. And there is truth to that statement. Very hard to get really good data on it, but there is some truth to it. <clears throat> the incidence of hepatic cephalopathy after TIPS 
uh, is here. You know, so by the first year, you've established probably what's going to happen. Uh, but then HE in 44%. And it's refractory in age. And then, if you have refractory encephalopathy, the guy won't wake up. This goes on for weeks and weeks. At the moment, the only way to fix that is to close or to narrow down the stent, make it smaller by putting a stent inside the stent. Uh, but that sometimes defeats the very purpose for putting it in the first place, which will save virus seal bleeding. So, um, so that's an issue that we deal with on a, uh, on a fairly frequent basis. As you know, uh, one of the things that we use to treat uh, uh, patients with recurrent virus seal bleeding is uh, non-selective beta blockers. And uh, unfortunately, there is some data uh, suggesting that patients who are on beta blockers <coughs> here survive of those people who are not taking beta blockers. So whether it's a selection issue or whether the drug, the beta blocker, actually in, 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 is inducing some uh, thing that impacts survival is not certain yet. I understand there may be effects of beta blockers on neutrophil function and other things. We're not quite sure what this is, but just handing out uh, non-selective beta blockers for patients with viruses and, and hoping that will be uh, uh, effective is it has to be taken, and you have to take into account the fact that you might be disimproving the survival by doing that. Uh, so there's some other studies um, uh, where 80% of the cases were identified cause of death in people on non-selective beta blockers, where most of the uh, the problem, 80% of it nearly was sepsis. So there is some suggestion, as I said, that the non-selective beta blockers may uh, alter neutrophil function. That might be part of it. Also, norepinephrine levels apparently rise when you're on beta blocker, and that itself also independently in some way or another alters neutrophil function. Liver disease alters uh, neutrophil function as well. So there's a lot of reasons why infection may be a big problem. To be honest with you, most of you, um, uh, if you are following a bunch of liver patients, uh, and I often have my fellow say, oh, I'm getting to know liver disease, I'm seeing this patient, I would say to them, you know, you, you're looking at this patient to be gone by next year, and you know, they are, they usually die of infection, it's extraordinary. Uh, there's now evidence that ammonia uh, certainly gets, uh, levels go higher in patients who've had um, uh, tips placed in certain, certain cases, and this uh, also affects uh, uh, a neutrophil function. So we have uh, ammonia, norepinephrine levels, and uh, non-selective beta blockers all doing negative things that might contribute to the already very high infection rates in these patients. This requires, obviously, a tremendous amount of research, uh, and uh, we need to counteract these problems. Now, the pararenal syndrome, now by the way, uh, just, just to let you know, liver transplantation is what you do when you failed with your medical therapy, just so we understand that. So pararenal syndrome is a very interesting, you know, disastrous event uh, in, the, in the course of a cirrhotic's life. Uh, there's two kinds that we look at now, type 1 and type 2, and the Asides Club, uh, which is mainly run by the Barcelona group, uh, have uh, come up with this. I always say, though, that they've defined panorenal so carefully that you can't actually find a case of panorenal anymore, and, and therefore you can't do a study. So they've kind of clogged, you know, blocked themselves in a way. So type 1 is very rapidly progressive, and the way they define that is an initial doubling of the serum creatinine. So if you start off at 1.5 and you go to 3, you know, something like that, then uh, in two weeks, then that's type 1, very rapidly progressive from panorenal syndrome. Uh, although you still have to rule out all the other causes of the at that point. It usually occurs with acute deterioration of circulatory function, so for instance, after paracentesis, certainly with infection uh, and maybe with other things. The natural prognosis is very poor. If you ever even write a case report and say a person survived what you think was uh, a panorenal syndrome type 1, the, the reviewers always tell you it isn't that because the patient survived. And, uh, you know, and so it's very hard to get anything published on that. Uh, although there is some uh, evidence-based uh, stuff I can show you later on. Type 2 is basically renal failure, but it's a more gradual onset. Um, the serum creatinine you know, is 1.5 to 2.5, uh, so it's not dramatic uh, you know, uh, renal failure, and it slowly progresses over time. And this one is particularly associated with uh, uh, refractory ascites, and many of these patients are getting multiple paracentesis. The diuretics are going up and down. So they've got pre-renal most of the time, but some of them then develop a progressive, slow increase 
in their creatinine, and that's a palomino type 2. Apart from lovely colors here, uh, the background of, uh, of, of liver patients uh, with no hepatorenal syndrome, which is on the left, the uh, type 1 and type 2, they have the same kind of background before they, uh, they develop, uh, for instance, in type 1 uh, and type 2 before their renal failure. So GI bleed is about similar in each of them before, uh, in the preceding period before they develop uh, their renal problems. Uh, and then other nephrotoxic drugs, particularly neomycin, which used to be uh, used a lot, but not anymore. Uh, also, uh, gentamicin itself can be a problem. NSAIDs, we're still trying to exclude people, or stop people who have advanced liver disease from taking NSAIDs because it does cause acute renal failure in a certain percentage of patients. Um, now, what's not surprising here, sorry, oops. <coughs> what's not surprising here is that uh, most of them have. Um, Okay. Most of them have had a large volume of paracetamol in the last four weeks. That doesn't mean it causes a panorenal. It just means that the patients who have a lot of ascites are at risk for getting a panorenal syndrome. And spontaneous bacterial peritonitis uh, is certainly a feature uh, down here uh, of uh, a lot of the cases that develop uh, panorenal syndrome. The pathogenesis of it is we obviously have underlying cirrhosis. We have poor life tension, which leads to ascites and this magical splatting vasodilatation. We have a decreased synthetic function and, if you like, detoxification function. So a lot of um, material is accumulating and vasodilating the system. But regardless, you get activation of the RAS system and you get sodium water retention, as I said before. You also get activation via the medulla oblongata and the pyroreceptor inhibition, where you have very striking synthetic uh, activation and you also get hyper-responsiveness to vascular uh, signals. This leads to a pattern renal syndrome. And if you look at a kidney of, of a person with advanced liver disease, all the blood is going to the cortex, or to the medulla. Very little is going to the cortex. And uh, when they get a pattern renal syndrome, uh, all you see is a slight change in that. So it already looks terrible, uh, but the renal function is compensated for probably by prostaglandins that increase, keeps the flow going. But if you give an NSAID and inhibit that prostaglandin, that kidney that was barely able to compensate suddenly <laughs> won't flow at all to the, uh, to the cortex and they go into acute renal failure. A type one, as I say, within two weeks, they'll have doubled their, their, their grad. Uh, so the, me the mechanism and targets in a paralytic syndrome, well, obviously we can get rid of the portal hypertension, reduce it, how much is the question? Uh, well, we do that with tips, and calibrating the tips is kind of important. We need a bit more information on exactly what number we should be aiming at when we're doing it. And it's not easy to control what pressure you'll get after you put the tips in. Uh, there's splatnic arterial vasodilatation through many mechanisms, and we now have a, a drug called Mithodrine, which we use to, uh, uh, to tighten, as it were, up the arterial vessels. So the splatnic basic is our, a vascular basic constrictor. We have octreotide, which somewhat does the same, although I have great reservations about octreotide's efficacy in the management of poor hypertension complications. And then something we don't have, I don't think yet, so maybe some of you have access to it through trials, but terlipressin is available in England, and they're using it now to manage patients who develop acute renal failure, which they diagnose as a paterenal syndrome in patients uh, in, uh, in England. And, uh, Albumin uh, uh, it, it reverses the, uh, the, the reduced effect of arterial blood volume, and it, it tones down, if you like, the uh, activation of the vasoconstrictor constrictor systems and real vasoconstriction. We have, for years and years, down the bottom right here, had uh, all sorts of devices developed for artificial liver support, and we haven't gotten very far. I don't think that's because there's, there's been no efficacy. I think that's more because it's a very expensive enterprise to actually prove that these, these things work, and any uh, most of the trials have not been conclusive yet. And then you can also dialyze the patient, which is not commonly done for true hepatorenal syndrome, but can be done. So the ASLD guidelines, and these tend to guide us in, in quite strongly. Uh, the diagnostic criteria, obviously, uh, we're going to diagnose a hepatorenal syndrome in a cirrhotic with ascites, typically whose serum creatinine is now greater than 1.5. There's no improvement in their, their renal function despite two days of diuretic withdrawal. 
and volume expansion with Albion. And by the way, the International Scientist Club we used to put in, you have to be four days off any dose of lactose, and there was three other criteria that was there. That's why you couldn't diagnose palomino syndrome for years. But th these are more uh, uh, appropriate uh, in, uh, ways of, di uh, of diagnostic criteria to follow. You surely shouldn't be in shock. You, you should, um, as I said, have volume expansion with some albumin. Uh, you should turn off or stop all the, the nephrotoxic drugs. And if the patient had them recently, you have to wait a bit longer before you can say the person has uh, palorenal syndrome or not. And on ultrasound, at least, there should be absence of parenchymal renal disease. And the treatment, uh, uh, there's very strict things to be looked at. And we're going to go through some of this data now. Albumin uh, plus vasoactive active drug of some sort like octreotide or mitodrine. Um, has not the efficacy is not conclusively proven, but there is some data suggesting it might help. And uh, we don't have trilipressin in the US, so I won't say too much about that. There is some data on it that I'll show you. And uh, what we normally do is we try and expedite referral for liver transplantation, uh, although uh, that doesn't always succeed. Uh, prevention of the hepatorenal syndrome with patoxifiline. I actually find this study a little hard to follow. But basically, as you can see there, the ones on with that strange green color line, I suppose that is, is it, yeah? Um, in that color, those patients who are on patoxifiline followed over time seem to have a, a reduction in or a, a improvement in renal function. In a group of patients that were selected to be already, to be just slightly uh, renal impaired at the start. So I think this study is just showing that patoxifiline may prevent worsening of liver disease, not a conclusive study. Uh, this is the study from the pentoxifiline and severe alcoholic hepatitis uh, in the world in the Journal of Gastroenterology. And as you can see, the, the survival probability if you were in severe alcoholic hepatitis was uh, improved by pentoxifiline. We have the American study as well. And the American study again showed perhaps a reduction in uh, uh, re uh, paterenal or renal failure uh, causing death. Uh, so. So we have some data on that, although the recent uh, prednisone treatment of, uh, of acute, acute alcoholic hepatitis have not been as convincing. Resistance to loop diuretics, uh, is, uh, which is basically by definition what's going on in those patients who have refractory ascites. They have a de the patients already have a decreased GF4 and low albumin. Concurrent drug therapy is contributing to their resistance to loop diuretics. So, Mitodrin has now been used. I think uh, most of my house staff will use mitodrin very quickly if you have a hypotense or a low pressure patient who is showing signs of renal failure. And uh, they don't wait very long, they start them on it pretty fast. And um, there's a number of studies, nothing is gigantic, but uh, there is some evidence to suggest, and I'm sorry, there's a lot of information here, but it's an alpha adrenergic agonist used for orthostatic hypertension. So we, these patients have moderate. Uh, 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 hypotension. Some of them have orthostatic hypertension. Actually. So this, um, so the patients had to have, you know, in this study, they were, they were getting mitogen 50 milligrams. They couldn't have any pre-existing problems, uh, suggesting underlying renal problems. And when they got the mitogen at 50 milligram dose, and the, the dose has been changed from one study to another, they got an increase in mean arterial pressure, so nearly 10 points, which actually is a fair bit in this type of patient. The systemic vascular resistance. Uh, went up significantly. The heart rate went down. Uh, increased renal plasma flow was uh, was found to uh, occur, and a lot of these things are significant. The GF4 was was closer to uh, the, the to not being significant, but actually still was significant. And um, there were patients, another uh, eight patients who had hepatorenal syndrome, were smaller of a short duration. So what you had. Full blown hepatorenal, the mitodrine wasn't quite so uh, uh, so effective, but still maybe there were some changes. In patients with refractory sideways, mitodrine improved blood pressure and decreased requirements for paracentesis. And that's the, the study by that person with the very long name there. And, uh, uh, and I must say, I use this, I think it does help. You do end up with these patients where you're, they're getting taps, and when they stand up, they just fall down. So sometimes just to prevent falls, we're giving them that, and uh, I think that makes sense. But I think we're all waiting for bigger studies. If we over-define these entities, we can't do studies on them. That's one, one thing we, we've learned from the International Societies Club uh, over time. But there is some evidence that mitigation mitigates certain aspects of the hepatorenal syndrome or the period just as you go into hepatorenal syndrome. Here's the combination of octreotide and mitodrine in patients with type 1 hepatorenal syndrome. 
And uh, as you can see, uh, the patients who got, uh, the mortality was uh, reduced when they had a combination of these drugs, and the creatinine uh, was less than uh, 1.5 in more of the patients who got the combination therapy. One of the things I do not like about octreotide is that there's actually a lot of data around if you hunt it down, which suggests that octreotide works the very first time you give it, then after that doesn't work very well. So it's a, it, you, it works, and then you get tachyphylaxis. So your portal pressure goes down, and then it goes back up again uh, pretty quickly, at least. And that data has been suppressed and has never been published. I've seen the papers and accepted the papers at least four times, uh, but it's never been published in the literature for reasons I can talk about later on. OK. Um, so uh, midgetrin, octreotide, there's more data. And Jelly, who is well known in this field, uh, you know, five patients, I realize it's a very short study, but he had albumin and octreotide. He had a regime of, uh, of midgetrin as well. And uh, after 20 days, there was a significant improvement in renal function and sodium excretion. This is in hepatorenal patients, syndrome patients. So, so, I mean, it's hard to get a lot of data, but the data that's coming out seems to support. Of course, all the negative data is never published, which is always a problem as well. So here's another study. Wong, sorry, this is Florence Wong, who's a famous renal uh, 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 complications of liver disease person. 14 patients with type 1 HRS. She gave them octreotide and midodrin, no albumin in this case, and uh, basically showed improvement in uh, serum creatinine and renal sodium excretion in these patients. I did uh, manage to increase arterial pressure uh, at least 10 points. So, so either we're going to use octreotide and midodrin, or midodrin and albumin, or all three of them together. There is some uh, support for doing that in the literature. And remember, almost by definition, if you survive, it wasn't a palorenal syndrome. But that doesn't mean that's true. It just means that uh, if you jump in with a therapy, you may be lucky and get some effect. But we much prefer to have conclusive evidence that in a randomized controlled trial that uh, these relatively expensive therapies are effective. Terdipressin, which we don't have, although there is a study, are we involved, are you involved in a study on terdipressin? No, not now, but uh, there, there is a study going on in the United States. I'm not sure why it's taking so long. I think it's just hard to find a perfect hepatorenal syndrome patient, uh, particularly if you use the, uh, the criteria from Barcelona. Um, so there's right, there, this vasoconstricts the splatnic and peripheral uh, uh, vessels uh, via the, the V1A receptor and results of vasoconstriction and vasopressor effects. Uh, and you can get quite significant bradycardia with it and reduced cardiac output. Remember, all the liver patients have parts that are pumping away. They're, all, they're almost vasodilated and, and high, excessively high cardiac outputs already. So losing some cardiac output may not be a big problem. The trouble about this uh, agent is that if you have a history of coronary artery disease, uh, you, there's a worry about you getting an acute MI if you use it. There's some concern about arrhythmias and cardiomyopathy. And so a lot of this stuff is vascular stuff, and they don't like to give it to you if they're over the age of 70. But uh, turning present uh, does, uh, and I've actually uh, seen results where someone had anuria, and then quite quickly after starting telepresent, uh, started to, to urinate again. So there is some evidence that it, that it works. I don't want to overdo this, but uh, this is uh, uh, the data from Salerno, who published a lot in this field. And in humans in survival, uh, 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 if they had actually a response to therapy, if they had a response to therapy, it was actually quite good compared to those who didn't have a response. But the humans in survival was improved uh, by this combination of albumin and basic deterrent present. That's why people in Europe are actually using it. And then uh, and this is a meta-analysis, and you can see that most of the uh, most of the, the trials, but not all of them, uh, favor uh, uh, favor uh, turning present, which is on this side of the line. Although these ones sort of cross over it, there's a few that actually are fairly impressive. But um, there isn't there's there's accumulating data over time. Uh, tips for uh, patients with a pyromenal syndrome. And by the way, though, I saw maybe 20 years ago. Uh, uh, I think it was 40 patients who had acute renal failure uh, and had tips, and something like 30 of them actually ended up uh, recovering. And uh, that was never actually presented even at the meeting. So there's something, there was suppression of some of that information. That was never published either, that paper. So the type 1 uh, pararenal syndrome is an uncontrolled trial, but there's a marked reduction in the portal uh, pressure gradient from, uh, uh, you know, Quite a, quite a lot, uh, and then improved renal function, 
And in the type 2 patients, again, on control studies, uh, significant improved renal function. So there is good evidence, but it's still early evidence, that terlipressin can help uh, turn around the pattern renal syndrome. Small scale studies, hopefully more are coming. We still have to, of course, define uh, a pattern, or a pattern renal syndrome properly, uh, or because we've already defined we can't get patients to put into randomized controlled trials. And I'll stop there and invite some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mullen. Very uh, wonderful review of a very complicated subject. I will tell the audience that as soon as I walked through the door and came to shake his hand, he looked at my beer and says, I like your beers. So Dr. Mueller and I uh, will start a new trend for 2013, so be aware for the next speaker. But this was a, a very wonderful review, and particularly for me, because I'm in ICU often. And we deal with these patients all the time, end up calling you guys and the nephrologists, and, and it's complicated. I wanted to ask you a question because you mentioned this concept that we all sort of agree with, that essentially almost all these patients die. Not that they all die, but that's the general intention. And when I hear that concept, we often have difficulties in engaging in true placebo control studies. And I work in the fibrosis world on the other life. And for decades after the diagnosis, there was never ever perform a true placebo control trial because it was considered unethical not to try something on someone who was surely to die. Do we have true placebo control trial? Because even when you add this uh, this drug that you have there versus placebo, these patients are getting albumin and their fluid yeah. changes yeah. and all these other things. So how do we address that? And, and the reason I, I highlight this is because when in this decade we started testing true placebo controlled trials, we found that every single agent we were trying, even though it was not considered experimental, was killing the patient. Yeah, well, we have something similar in our field uh, where we used to give treatment to prevent encephalopathy after TIPS and thought it worked very well, but when we did a proper placebo control trial, it had no effect at all. And, uh, and so it, you know, that's an illustration of that. I think the ethical problem always comes when a lot of data comes out of this, and bits and pieces, small trials, things like that, and eventually the human investigation committees believe that there's enough data to say we need to use this drug, we can't do a placebo controlled trial. The other thing that comes up, which is there's a standard noise that everyone has, they're all on this and that and the other thing, so you just add your treatment to that and add placebo to that. And it makes interpretation of things very difficult, I agree. Uh, I think when you, you define a panorenal syndrome uh, type 1 as universally lethal, uh, then, uh, you know, again, if there's some suggestion that something works, it's very hard to get permission to do a placebo control trial. But I don't think there's anything wrong with at least establishing that it does something. If, if you can do just an initial observation of five or six patients, they all recover, then 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 we should do a placebo control trial. Uh, but the trouble by then, the genie's out of the box, we can't do it because everyone knows about it. It's a big problem, you know. Good question. Mike. It was an excellent talk. Thank you so much. I thought I thought the two slides you had of the, the pathogenesis of hemoglobin um, starting with renal dysfunction, increased nitric oxide, uh, yeah. the yeah. circulation, and then um, you know activation of RAS and antidiuretic hormone clinical badness were very important. One of my former medical students who's now at NYU sent me an article last year arguing that the initial the initial shot in exacerbation of CHF is actually dilatation of the splenic circulation. Hmm. For some reason, reason we don't understand, and then it activates all those all those terrible pathways. Is, is there is there are there data linking subclinical liver dysfunction to exacerbation of CHF? Um, well, as you know, would you well, summarize yeah. the, the concept? He's asking is the video. Yeah, yeah, is there an association between uh, cardiac uh, or some association between cardiac decompensation and and vasodilatation of the splenic arterial or vessels? I, I'm not sure if there is there is a novel amount of liver dysfunction in patients with heart failure. Period. You know, and Sheila Sharlock wrote papers on this years ago, and there's many other people who have written this. So there is a, a, a strong interaction. I don't know if I have a specific answer to the issue that you're raising, but it's a good point. And the more we look for these type of things, the more we find them. But at the moment, I'm not aware of any really conclusive data on that. Cardiologists have any comment on that? Any other questions? Yes, sir. So what's your view on the base repression antagonists in the treatment of hypotremia? <laughs> Great question. Um, 
summarize it. Yeah, please. What, what do I think of tolaptin as a treatment for uh, hyperventremia in liver patients and other patients, I assume, as well? Um, I tell you something interesting. I, I, I was approached about doing that trial, and in, the, in, in three years previously, I had did the trial with another uh, drug a bit like that. And uh, I had plenty of patients when I originally did the original study with hyponatremia. I have no one with hyponatremia now. So we've accidentally figured out how not to cause hyponatremia in our hospital. And as a result, I don't have any patients to put in trials, which I think is great because I, I don't, hyponatremia is bad stuff. Um, so I think that, I, I think um, uh, there, there's two schools of thought. There's the give a bolus of hypertonic saline, but a very limited amount of hypertonic saline. I think that came out of someone in, in, uh, in Texas, and then, of course, Talbaptin. Uh, the reason we're very interested in Talbaptin is actually to do with hyponatremia, because hyponatremia aggravates uh, padding cephalopathy. So in theory, if we gave Talbaptin, got this same so it's come up slowly, we probably would make our patients better. And I have, I have done it myself, but my colleagues who in the transplant centers will occasionally give it to someone with intractable uh, encephalopathy. You can't get them out of encephalopathy you should start normalizing that serum sodium for sure. Not quickly, <laughs> slowly. And that, that's what Telvaptin does, I think. Yeah. Questions? So, <clears throat> with the coded versus the uncoded stent, you know that the stenosis rate is, is uh, lower in the coded stent. Yes. Now that same study that showed that the encephalopathy rate is also lower in the, in the coded stent. Yeah. That exactly makes sense. Oh, well, I'll tell you why it does, or should. <laughs> Whenever you have to revise a TIPS, you open up everything and you guess you put yourself at a great risk of getting encephalopathy. So it's all the interventions that give you more encephalopathy. If you don't have to intervene, you have less encephalopathy. That's really what it is. is it, does that make sense to you? Yeah. So I think that's what it was. Because I was puzzled by that as well. And then it dawned on me they were just they didn't have to keep opening them up, so they weren't having these newly opened up. Uh, uh, stent uh, or dilatations uh, occurring, which typically do cause bouts of cephalopathy. Yeah. Let me ask one last question. Well, actually, there's one yes, here. There's someone who's trying to say. What's your experience of using plastic lens analog to be the <laughs> My experience is zero, but um, uh, I, I, I do understand there, there is a rationale for it, but I'm not aware of an awful lot of data. So, like infusing in intravenous prostaglandins, perhaps. Uh, I mean, I don't know how you would direct that to do the right thing in the kidney, but it certainly is something that theoretically could be tried. So, it's a good idea because really, the the kidney in the cirrhotic patient has become prostaglandin dependent. So, what you're saying is, if they suddenly lose function, why not just give them back? I, just, I don't know if it's quite that simple, but it's it's, it's, it's something you can pursue uh, in experiments and see does it work eventually. Tell us briefly, as a last question um, for the students and others, um, liver and lung. We often find abnormalities in blood gases, pulmonary hypertension, just very quickly. Well, those. you know, straight liver disease is associated with a certain number of patients who get pulmonary hypertension, and, uh, and, and they're very hard to manage. The, the, the poor pulmonary syndrome is where the vessels in the lung vasodilate, and the blood is shooting through the lung so fast it doesn't get oxygenated. And these are the people who walk orthodeoxy and everything, and they can have clubbing and a very impressive hypoxia. Uh, so if you have a hypoxia documented in a cirrhotic patient, think about that shunting syndrome. You have to make sure there's not shunting in the heart, because an ASD or something else might confuse the picture. But but uh, there is a very striking portal pulmonary syndrome. And by the way, it goes away when you do a transplant, which is kind of important. The port hypertension uh, uh, so associated with pulmonary hypertension syndrome is a little different. Some people think it might be an end result of long-standing vessel dilatation. I don't think uh, that's true. But the people who report pulmonary hypertension who have liver disease will do reasonably well and can get transplanted on, under the uh, use of Flolam, you know, a, a vessel dilator, which is a prostaglandin actually, uh, following up on what you asked. So uh, the polypulmonary syndrome and uh, pulmonary hypertension are both associated with liver disease. By the way, the polypulmonary syndrome with all the blood shunting to the lungs isn't always associated with just cirrhosis. You can just have a congenital shunt or just some shunting you know, around your liver and this can develop over time. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Terrific. Terrific. Thank you so much. So unless you are totally against this, somebody's going to come and take a picture of us. Oh, that's good. Okay.
So how's the weather uh, 